So welcome everyone uh, to this launch and of our updates from the A22 Global Climate Change Civil Resistance Network. Citizens from Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Norway, Switzerland, UK and the United States, known together as the A22 Network, are currently involved in ongoing, and when I, when I say ongoing, I mean ongoing right at these minutes, uh, unprecedented campaigns of non-violent disruption to force governments to stop the greatest betrayal of our young people and the next generations. And when we say the greatest betrayal, um, it's not only us saying that. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said of the latest IPCC report, it is an atlas of human suffering. Delay on action means death. And as you will have seen in the news and perhaps reported yourselves, citizen members of the A22 network are blockade, blockading roads, train tracks, fossil fuel infrastructure, leading to mass arrests taking place as we speak. Others around the globe have participated in open-ended hunger strikes, forcing governments to respond. This is the new face of nonviolent climate crisis resistance. Civil resistance is a communicative act of what needs to change, and civil resistance needs vision. And as such, the network has agreed on its declaration, which Bayer Constantino will read out for you now. Thank you, Alex. We are the last generation of the old world. We are here today to say we will create a new world where humanity embraces itself, forgives itself, loves itself, and commits to continue our great adventure. As the last generation, we will do whatever it takes to protect our generation and all future generations as is our inalienable right. The old world is dying. We are in the last hour, the darkest hour. This world is being decimated before our eyes. We are in between moments. What we do now decides the fate of both this world and the next. So we decide. We decide we are no longer indulging in our fears, our despair, our resentments. We are putting ourselves behind us. Together in community, we are taking hold of a higher purpose, the source of what it is to be truly human. It calls to us across the ages, and with its power, we will bring down those who kill to maintain the regimes of extraction. This is the old world. It cannot continue. We are here to make clear humanity is better than to give in to extinction. We are here to say society has not turned away from love and truth. It has not embraced evil and death. The world we desire, the one we can have, is already in reach. But we have to reach for it. We are not here to highlight, plead, or to entertain. We are here to reach for the change that is required for this to happen. We are here to force governments to slash carbon emissions, nothing less. We are here for action, not words. We have a plan. We are mobilizing in our many nations and many cultures. Teams will run projects, projects will make demands on governments. We are reaching out to anyone who will reach back and join hands to create this new world. If we are refused, we will disrupt week after week as those who came before us did many times in the struggle for human rights. We speak directly to the public and recruiting hundreds of open meetings. We commit to mass civil disobedience. This is our solemn responsibility. Sacred rights require a sacred duty to defend them. And until everyone is free, none of us are free. Only then will justice be done. We will not fall into the trap of hating the other. The other is part of all of us. Our hands do not hold weapons and our hearts are open. 
We are humanity, believing in humanity. We are democracy. We are open and nonviolent. We are care and we are freedom. We will accept the consequences of our actions and look our destiny directly in the eye. Bring it on. While there remains breath in our bodies, we will not stop. This is our life now. We are the last generation, but we are also the first. We are everywhere. We are coming. Everything will change. The old becomes the new and everyone can change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bea. Um, I'm going to go straight now over to climate scientist, uh, Peter Kalmus, uh, co-founder of Climate Ad uh, and another of uh, a number of other organizations, um, who's here today to speak on his own behalf, um, also about his arrest with uh, Scientist Rebellion last week, um, about the need for um, nonviolent disruption and civil disobedience. So thank you, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, and I wanted to clarify that I'm not the leader of Scientist Rebellion. I am just a member of Scientist Rebellion. Um, uh, that was a beautiful statement, Bea. And um, I believe that the fossil fuel industry and world leaders that are working to expand the fossil fuel industry in full knowledge of the implications for the future of humanity and life on Earth are committing what we could refer to as neocide, which is the systematic murder of young people and future generations. Um, it's that serious. And there's this incredibly large collective cognitive dissonance between what those who deeply understand the facts of climate change and um, ecological breakdown and what's coming if we continue on this insane track that we're on currently of continuing to expand the fossil fuel industry despite the clarion call just a few days ago from the IPCC that says we have to have a moratorium on all new fossil fuel infrastructure. In fact, existing fossil fuel in infrastructure is, is more than enough to take us past, well past one and a half degrees Celsius of mean global heating and into realms that will be absolutely catastrophic and potentially risk everything that we love, including civilization as we know it. So <laughs> this is not being reported currently in the mainstream media in the terms that I just laid it out, um, which is part of why the public doesn't understand the depths of the emergency that we're actually in, which is why when you look around you, everyone is still doing everything they used to do, burning fossil fuels, um, flying in planes, uh, driving SUVs. Um, and when activists try to desperately raise awareness that we're in an emergency, um, they are still being uh, ridiculed, for example, on air by news anchors um, in the public. The public, um, you know, still feels that, uh, you know, saving a few minutes to get to work is more important than having a livable planet, essentially. Um, and we are, we've tried so many things to raise awareness and, and create social change on this. And now is the time for mass civil disobedience. So I want to just emphasize a quote, another quote from Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Antonio Guterres, who said on the day of the release of the momentous IPCC Working Group 3 AR6 report, I quote, climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals, but the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. Our task here in both Scientist Rebellion and all the other groups that are pushing for mass climate civil disobedience is to wake the world up to the actual emergency that we are in. Um, I was arrested last Wednesday um, by engaging in uh, climate civil disobedience in what, what I consider to be a desperate attempt 
to essentially um, protect my children <laughs> and to protect the parts of this planet that I love, which are all parts of this planet, and to protect uh, young people everywhere and people who don't have a voice, um, vulnerable people, poor people, and people who are coming in the future. Um, this was a global rebellion from sci climate scientists, other scientists, and supporters, and it will not stop. Scientists are well aware that all of the impacts that we've been living through so far are going to get worse and worse, that new impacts will arise that we haven't seen yet, and new synergies uh, and bad interconnections between the impacts that we're seeing and uh, civilizational systems, um, for example, the food system, the water system, the political system, um, will continue to get worse. It's like pushing at a wall harder and harder and harder. If you keep ramping up the force every single day, eventually the wall will break. Um, and uh, eventually, if we continue on this course, uh, big, big things will start to break, which means that lots and lots of people will die and there will be lots of suffering. Um, so it's, uh, it's in my mind, a, a huge shame that we are at this point now, um, especially since we knew about what was coming um, for many, many decades. But the fossil fuel industry has very systematically and deliberately suppressed that information and suppressed action and have infiltrated the politics of our world leader, leaders and have even infiltrated the news media, which has made it much, much harder to create um, awareness and to create a movement that can stand up to the fossil fuel industry. And um, with, without standing up to the fossil fuel industry and um, having a movement that is as powerful or more powerful than the fossil fuel industry, um, because of the way it has infiltrated, infiltrated the public sphere, um, that means that there will not be a public of, I mean, it's, the, the, those in power right now will not voluntarily make the huge and rapid transformations that we need to um, divert the pat, the track of, civil, of, of our society from this disaster and towards where we all know it needs to go, right? It's, there's no secret about what the solutions are anymore. So um, the last thing I will say is that um, for me personally, um, the civil disobedience action that I engaged in last week was a profoundly spiritual experience and um, in some way um, incredibly satisfying and empowering and hope-giving and life-affirming. And the solidarity that I feel with the movement now and all of those around the world who are engaging in similar actions and risking their jobs, their freedom, their bodies, it is perhaps the most beautiful feeling that I've ever felt. And I want um, a lot of other people to experience this, um, not just scientists. I certainly want as many climate scientists as possible to start participating in these actions, but everybody. Um, uh, I don't care what your job is, whether you're a historian or an artist or a sociologist or a psychologist or a lawyer, it doesn't matter. Um, we're all humans. We're all on this planet and we depend on it for life. And um, whether we know it or not, a lot of us already know it very explicitly that we're deeply in love with this planet. But somewhere down there, we, we were created by this planet. It's our mother and we're all deeply in love with it. And we have to reconnect with that. Um, and mass climate civil disobedience is the probably the best way I can think of uh, for doing that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, th there's there's no words of summary that I can add to that for um, how profound um, the experiences that you've shared and the need for what you raised there is the issue of solidarity uh, across peoples and, uh, and, and across the world. Um, and and on, on that note, I'm going to introduce now the campaigns that have come together uh, to form this international network of civil resistance. Um, a list of which has already been posted in the chat, I believe. Um, so present today uh, and founding partners in this Citizens Network are Fireproof Australia, Save Old Growth Canada. Uh, apologies for my um, 
pronunciations. Uh, Dernier Re Renovation, France. Letze, Generation Germany. Ultima Generazione, Italy. Stop Oliatinga, Norway. Renovate Switzerland. Just Stop Oil, UK. And Declare Emergency, US. So I'm now going to hand over to first uh, Letze Generation Germany, followed by Just Stop Oil UK, and then Save Old Growth Canada to explain their involvement in the network and to give updates uh, and views from their country. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, um, my name is Carla, and this morning I got arrested and spent some hours in a cell for peacefully blocking a German highway. And this moment, still over 60 fellows and friends of mine sit in cells in the police department of Frankfurt in Germany. I'm an ordinary girl. In my normal life, I study law in Germany. I usually love studying, but while our government drives us into an absolute collapse of our ecosystems, and with that into the collapse of society as we know it, I can't stand behind my desk studying. War, terror, and more emissions are fueled by fossil fuel madness that financed with billions of euros still. I feel a moral responsibility to do everything which is possible in a nonviolent way to force my government to leave their murderous path. We face a planetary crisis, so we need a planetary response. When our campaign in Germany meets its demands, this crisis will still be a crisis. We need a global response. That's why people all over the globe decide to step into civil, nonviolent disobedience. People forcing their governments to finally take actions. So with A22, we unite internationally to face this planetary crisis. We know together we can create the tension it needs all over the globe to create change. So last August in Germany, Seven young people decided to go on hunger strike, asking the three chancellor candidates for a public talk about the murder of the young generations. After 27 days without food and seven hours without water, one day before the election, the leader in the polls and now chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, called to agree on a public talk. Not only our example, but all throughout history, we see civil resistance works. When the tension in society is high enough, political decision makers will not be able to ignore us. Through the hunger strike, we mobilized 30 committed people willing to go to prison for their blocking motorways. We blocked German highways starting in January for almost six weeks on a daily basis. In the end, we also disrupted ports and airports with more and more people joining and started a storm of media attention and discussions in society up to a discussion in parliament. People are willing to leave their normal lives behind to start civil resistance. Ordinary people quit their jobs, stop going to school and university, stop being a bystander in this deadly course of our government, not only in Germany, but worldwide. Yesterday, we started the highway blockades in Frankfurt, which is the German heart of the fossil fuel madness. This madness has to stop now. We are here with now over 150 people willing to stay and to go into prison if the government chooses to put ordinary people into cells rather than stop killing people in the global south today and our children tomorrow. Thank you a lot for your attention. And I will now hand over to Claudia from the United Kingdom. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, my name is Claudia Ben Rojas. I am 24 years old and I am here today as a supporter of Just Stop Oil UK, who are in active civil resistance to demand that the UK government do the right and necessary thing by stopping all new fossil fuel projects. I became involved in civil resistance because growing up I was always aware of the climate crisis as an issue. But I, like many people, I believe that our governments, that our world leaders had our best interest at heart and that ultimately they would do the right thing. And year after year I watched this emergency get worse and worse and more and more urgent. I watched how lakes in my home country in Chile that used to be the size of Grand Central Park in New York, dried up 
into almost nothing. Whole communities displaced because they no longer have access to water. And this sort of thing is happening right now all over the world. And what is the response from our so-called leaders? Nothing but empty promises and lies. And so I realized that this change that we need is never going to come from the rich elite in power. This change that we so desperately need must come from people power. It must come from ordinary people coming together to say enough is enough. And history is full of examples of this happening. You have the suffragettes movement in the UK in 1928 and the salt marches in India in the 1930s. And you have, you know, the people's revolution that's happened in Sudan just in 2019. These are examples of how change is possible and change is possible. Right now, we have a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a habitable future. And the reality is that this is a global issue that requires global collaboration and solidarity to create a movement that cannot be ignored. And today is an example of this beginning to happen. So the reality is that we need everyone to get involved. This is the fight for our lives and we need to act like it. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our children. We owe it to the people who are already greatly suffering and we owe it to those who are still yet to come. The time is now to come together, to act and to resist for our future. And with that, I would like to pass it on to Sane from Save Old Grove, Canada. Thanks. Um, yeah, my name is Zane. I'm 21 years old and I'm one of the people who started Save Old Grove here in Canada. Um, so I can briefly talk about the campaign and what we've done over the past few months. And just to give some background, uh, in British Columbia, we've got 2.7% remaining old growth forests. These are forests that are over 250 years old or older. Some of them are thousands of years old. And over the past year, we had a big blockade in the forests in British Columbia, or during which over a thousand people got arrested. And a lot of people who were involved in that <clears throat> now recognize that it failed. And there are many reasons why it failed, which is what led to the, the starting of Save Old Growth. So one of the reasons was that it was tucked away in the woods uh, and it was not disrupting the public. The other reason was, was that there were a thousand arrests, but those thousand arrests happened over, over a year, right? And <clears throat> so those are the main two reasons why a lot of people who were involved in that started recognizing that we needed to do something more. So a few people who were involved in the blockade and a few people who were involved in Extinction Rebellion in Vancouver decided to start a separate campaign that would have a deadline of six months. So we started uh, doing actions in January and we set a deadline of mid-July, by the end of which we want to achieve legislative change to end all old growth logging in BC. So our demand is that the government of British Columbia should pass legislation that would ban all old growth logging. Over the past few months, they've been giving a lot of uh, speeches saying that uh, an X number of area has been deferred, which doesn't mean anything. What we want is legislative change. So we started our first iteration in January during which uh, over 50 people got arrested. And now we've started actions as of last week in Vancouver and other parts of BC where we've been disrupting the Trans-Canada Highway. And in disrupting the Trans-Canada Highway, uh, we have three main goals. One is to disrupt the economy during the morning rush hour because it is the main highway that is used across BC. The other goal is to clog up the courts. So to have enough arrests that it has too much of a pressure on the British Columbian government that they have to uh, come to the table with us. And we have been liaising with the premier's uh, chief of staff as of two weeks ago about potentially ending the demonstrations if the government declares that it will pass legislation. And the other thing uh, we've been doing is one of our members, Brent, has been on a hunger strike for 18 days to demand a public meeting with the Minister of Forests uh, in British Columbia. Uh, as of today, he's on day 19. So one of the premises that this campaign is based on is obviously telling the truth. And telling the truth is not this abstract concept that we just uh, speak the truth in a very sort of scientific manner. What this means is that we prophetically tell the truth and engage the public in this debate 
that we're facing human annihilation. And what this means practically for us is doing hundreds of meetings around Vancouver and other parts of British Columbia, where we tell the public that in the next 20 years, the North Shore will burn down, Vancouver will burn down, and large, large parts of British Columbia will be underwater. And what we do then is that we sit down on the road and we disrupt the public because that's what people did in the civil rights movement and throughout history is that they disrupted the public. They were sitting down on lunch counters. They were sitting down on buses, disrupting transit. They were sitting down on bridges. So when we disrupt the public, we are engaging in our democratic responsibility of telling the truth uh, and non-violently communicating the truth to the public. Because it's only in a very superficial democracy that we go to the ballot boxes once every four years and tick a box, right? In a true democracy, we nonviolently tell the truth by disrupting the public. And that's how, <clears throat> sorry, that's how we avoid civil wars in civilized countries, is that we nonviolently communicate the truth and disrupt the public. And the few truths that aren't being talked about at all is the fact that nothing that everything we've been doing over the past 30 years has been a total failure. Uh, and that's one of the first realities that we need to understand. Not just, so it's not just lies being told by the media or the government, although that's true, it's being lies that dominate the activist space. So we need to start by recognizing that it's immoral to do banner drops outside of a death camp. And it's immoral to do banner drops and marches and petitions when we're faced with genocidal governments. And it's impractical, which is why we're uh, disrupting highways and doing going on long hunger strikes. So this month, you'll be disrupting many parts of the Trans-Canada Highway at multiple points to demanding end to old growth logging. And if the government doesn't uh, give in to our demand this month, we will pause during May to recruit thousands of people to risk arrest on the highways in June. And our proposition is that if we get over a thousand arrests on the highways within two weeks, we're going to push the government to end uh, old growth logging in the province of BC because it's supported by over 80% of British Columbians. And it's, uh, uh, it's in the old party manifesto of the NDP. So if the NDP, uh, the, new the new Democratic Party, if they fail to implement this, then they're failing to implement the policy that has the most amount of support in British Columbia and it's in their own party manifesto. And if they fail to implement this, then they're revealing themselves to be mass murderers, which they objectively already are. And that's what countries around the world are doing is that they're they're revealing their governments to be genocidal governments. And when we're faced with a genocidal government, our options become binary. And to speak the truth means being in prison. And I and, and quite a few other people are facing a long prison sentence. I myself am facing a pr prison sentence for 60 days in the next two weeks, potentially. And other people are facing really long sentences as well. But our proposition is that the government can do whatever it wants to us because we're not going anywhere. And if we get enough people to do that, uh, around the world, then we will get our demands. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carla, Claudia, and Zane, uh, for those um, really passionate and clear and lucid um, and thoughtful um, updates and contributions. Um, I'm going to invite any of the attendees to uh, ask questions through the Q and A. Um, if you would prefer to be allowed to speak uh, and ask your questions, I can allow that through the uh, wonders of Zoom to do that. Um, I have a couple of questions here that I'm going to start with, but uh, feel free while I'm asking to ask any uh, Q&A at the, the bottom. I believe um, all of the panellists are going to be spotlighted now so that you can see the other panellists. But I, this first question I'm going to put to Carla to begin with simply because you've just come straight from being arrested. Um, and then if any of the other panelists want to raise their hands to respond to it, please do. And I'll go to the first. Um, this question is, so a major barrier to civil resistance, uh, even for those who support you, is, is this fear of the arrest uh, and the fear of the effects on livelihoods. Um, Peter spoke of it as a spiritual experience, um, but, but many people may not see it like that. Um, do you have a figure of how many people you need to get arrested um, is it the three and a half percent that we hear about so much? Um, and, and maybe actually, Carla, you can explain a little bit more about the, the, the experience of your arrest this morning. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so about my experience this morning, uh, so I was just with a group of, we were, uh, I think, nine people uh, blocking this one uh, highway, other 
groups in the city as well. Um, and then I got arrested and I stayed in a cell for, I think, two and a half hours. It was not a nice experience, but it was all right because I feel really motivated when I'm on the streets with these people because I know I'm on the right place right now and doing the right thing. And I don't really see myself doing something else right now when we uh, face this crisis we are in. And when it comes to the number it needs for arrests, I don't think there's a real number. I think that you can, yeah, you can also make, yeah, start a storm like we did with 30 people in January, but to really force the government to, to so yeah, not ignore our demands anymore. We need more people. And I think we need over a thousand people. But I feel like in Germany, we are really on a good way to, yeah, to um, get more and more people. And we see that more and more people are joining and that we will reach those, those numbers where we, yeah, where we have the chaos on the streets because um, we block so many highways that the government is not able to ignore us anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Um, did, does, do any of the other panelists want to come in on that? I'll give you five seconds to put up your hands, otherwise I will move on to the next question. Um, okay, well, Carla, you answered that incredibly well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question. How can, um, uh, how can you say that the last 30 years have been a failure? Um, when so much awareness about the climate has been raised. I think that came in as directly in response to something that you said, Zane. Uh, so I don't know if you want to respond to that. And then if, again, if any of the other panelists want to, you can raise your hand and come in afterwards. Um, well, I think the, the bottom line is that since 1990, carbon emissions have gone up by over 50%. So whatever we want to, you know, what else, any, anything else you want to consider, that's our top level stat is that carbon emissions have gone up by 50% since 1990, right? Uh, like the awareness raising was done in 1990 and we don't need 30 years of awareness raising. And so the bottom line is that the carbon emissions have gone up. Um, and, and yesterday we disrupted Al Gore's climate dinner in Vancouver. And we later heard that he did lead, read our letter and he made a speech where he said that he sometimes wonder whether anything he's doing is working at all. So he's right about that everything that he's doing is not working. And that first step was done in 1990. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Um, thank you, Zane. Um, got a question now um, from Anya Kamenetz. Um, How does it feel to be telling the truth when so many other people are living in denial? Um, she hasn't directed that. They haven't directed that to anyone in particular. Um, are there any of the panelists who would like to respond to that? How does it feel to be telling the truth and so other many people are living in denial? Um, Peter, would you like to speak first and then I'll go to Vebjorn? Ve yeah, um, just briefly. First of all, it feels surreal. Um, and second, even though I'm a climate scientist and I have been for a pretty long time because of all the people living in denial and the inaction all around me and by world leaders, even I sometimes have to sort of metaphorically pinch myself by going back to the science and reading papers and reading the IPCC reports and just reminding myself that yes, it really is as bad as I think. Um, so it's a, it's, not any fun to be a Cassandra and I wish that I didn't have to speak out and act out like this. I think in a sane world um, the scientific facts would be enough to motivate world leaders um, but that hasn't happened so we have to act out now. Thank you Peter. Um, I, I, I see that Bjorn's hands gone down so I'll go to Anai from Renovate Switzerland. No, your hand has gone down. Um, can you can you unmute the name? No. So M Michelle, should we come to you? Sorry, I'm now unmuted. Sorry, oh. I couldn't do it myself. Apparently, sorry, I'm Anais. 
Um, I think it's a really fucked up experience uh, to be shouting that loud and uh, not heard. However, I do feel a lot of empathy for all the people who are not um, hearing this truth, who uh, for whom it's too much, or um, yeah, they have too much going on in their lives, life is difficult as it is, information overload, anything like that. Um, and I think one major failure of the climate movement and their so-called allies in the world of politics for the last 30 years has been to put so much emphasis on individual responsibility and individual effort. People have their lives to mind, and it's a lot. So we need systemic changes. We need um, the path where we are on to be the right path and not rely on individuals to have to go out of their way um, in order to get to the right place. So yeah, I do feel empathy for the people who do not um, do what I do and see what I do. Um, and I really think we cannot get anywhere without legislative change and our elites actually um, starting to give a fuck. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, nice. Um, we'll just come to Michelle to answer this again briefly and then there, there's more questions. So we'll, we'll move on. Uh, so if you can be brief, Michelle. Yes, I will be very brief. Uh, and I just wanna say that, yes, there is a lot of, uh, folks who are unaware the how it feels to be telling the truth is it feels fabulous to tell the truth sitting in my home and thinking what can we do is so painful and so coming out and being able to shout out and say this is happening just is so liberating and that um, passion will tap into those who don't know and that's why we're doing what we're doing Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question from uh, the attendees here. Um, who is the main funder of this activism? Um, I don't know who would want to respond to that. Um, I'd imagine um, that the, uh, you know, it's, it's different in each country, but it, um, would someone like to respond to that? Peter? Yeah, so for us in Los Angeles, um, it was just, so our only expenses are legal fees and the funding for that came from crowdsourcing. Thank you. Um, are there any other answers uh, in relation to the A22 network? I mean, I understand that um, uh, some of the support for this work has come from the Climate Emergency Fund. Um, I don't know if that's relevant and true for each country. So, Carla, did you put your hand up there? Yeah, I just wanted to um, point out that we need a lot of money, actually, for what we're doing. Right now, we have 150 people in Frankfurt, so we uh, we need um, housing for them. We need um, money for banners and for all the materials, so we need a lot of money, and we are lucky we get a lot of uh, supporters who um, yeah, support us with some money, just from ordinary people giving 10 euros, 15 euros, whatever, but we... Yeah, but we still uh, struggle a lot when it comes to finances. Thank you. Uh, Sergio from Fireproof Australia. Yeah, we most of our funding has come from the Climate Emergency Fund. And through that funding, we've been able to uh, fly out and invite uh, all like a massive portion of this huge city in Sydney. Um, to get involved in this kind of campaign and warn them about the harm that's coming down the line, the floods, the fires and the smoke and about uh, our demands to the government. So it's been very helpful. Thank you, Sergio. Um, one question here. Um, this is very kind, I uh, think, that um, there are many journalists in the audience here, but how do people donate to the Climate Emergency Fund to support this work? Um, is there a central way to do that or can they support your individual campaigns? I mean, it, I'm assuming that they, it can be done through the climateemergencyfund.org website um, to donate directly. Um, but obviously if you wanted to support any of the groups in the, in the in individual countries, I know that that can be done as well. Um, so yeah, the, I'll, well, I think we'll put the link to the climate emergency fund, um, uh, website into the chat so that you've got that information. Um, it's now three 45. 
Um, I said it's really important that we keep <laughs> tell the truth and keep to our promises and keep to time because uh, people are very busy uh, and uh, perhaps people need to get back out into their actions as well. Um, unless there is any last pressing questions that need to be answered here, uh, we'll follow up with everything else um, via email uh, that you shared when you signed up for all of the attendees. So on that note, there's nothing else being raised as urgent. Um, I just want to thank everyone for attending, for coming along, for asking questions. Um, and obviously I want to thank Peter Kalmus uh, for coming and sharing his experience for the um, panelists from all of the nine organizations that have come together in this A22 network. Uh, we're very thankful uh, and proud of the work you're doing. Uh, and I really appreciate, and I'm sure the attendees do, your clear, articulate, uh, powerful, profound, um, and moving answers. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you, we, there will be a transcript and video recording of this conference available, uh, which we will share. Um, and I, uh, I hope to see your stories soon about this really important work that's being done. So thank you, everyone. Goodbye.